the Growth Happens Dawn to Dusk podcast with Matt Devitt. He talks with people about their journey, where they succeeded and failed to help others on their quest. We're all on a journey that starts and ends every day. This is when we grow between dawn and dusk. And now your host, Matt Devitt. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, always wanted to say that. Welcome everybody to the Growth Happens Dawn to Dusk podcast. I'm Matt Devitt, and I'll be taking you on a journey today with a really good friend of mine, Brent Steinacker. But before kicking off the show, just want to ask everybody out there on the interwebs and social media, look me up. Uh, You can find me at Matt Devitt is the best way to look me up on Twitter, on Instagram. You can find me on LinkedIn all over those places. So definitely check me out. Uh, Give me a like, give me a connection. Really want to hear your guys' feedback on how this is hitting you, if it's something that you're finding of value. Now back to Brent. Brent is a fantastic guy. I've known him for a long time, as you'll find out. And he's barely crushed in his mid-20s. And this guy has got mad momentum at what he's doing. So he's exactly the kind of person that represents that whole growth happens from dawn until dusk. Really excited to share this with you guys. Have a great day, have a great afternoon, evening, wherever you are starting or ending your day, and I hope you really enjoy this. And if you do really like it, please definitely leave a comment, give me a five star, thumbs up, Stitcher, iTunes, all over the place, wherever you're looking at this, all of it really helps. So I appreciate it. Now enjoy the show. So Brent, thanks for uh, making the time for the podcast, really looking forward to discussing or actually just listening to you tell me you know your journey and how you got from you know the kid I knew way back in the day and and full disclosure for everybody there's a family connection here so you know way way back in the day um, when you were living out in Phoenix to now being you know a part of Ford's 30 under 30 and I know that's a lot of of time within there but you know, just, you know, maybe a little bit about yourself and, and kind of, you know, how, what you think helped, you know, lead you there, you know, if that's not too broad um, and, and by all means, if uh, you want to, you know, bang questions away at me, I mean, definitely go for, for sure. it, man. This, so the so interesting thing about the 30 under 30 thing though, to, to give you a preface on that, I actually had to turn down the 30 under 30 this year because I had an out of country vacation that kind of lined up. So I would have missed a couple of the dates and we were trying to figure it out, but the best, uh, the best spot was just to give it up to somebody else to have them take the spot. So I'll apply next year and hopefully get in. But yeah, that's, that's how that worked out this year. So. And and that was to uh, go watch your, your younger brother play football, right? Um, Well, no, this one's actually going on spring break with my little brother. So I didn't, I didn't go on spring break when I was in high school. I'm going to be as a chaperone. You could say if I have the uh, (laughs) maturity level for that, I'm not sure. I mean, that's all right. I mean, at least he's got a sounding board to be like, you think they'll be too mad if I do this? Like, oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think, I think I've mad. primed them well enough through my high school years to uh, get a, probably get away with whatever you want. That is, uh, that is one of the things I think, uh, you know, being the oldest. So I think my younger sister, uh, she enjoyed the fact I blazed a pretty wide path for her to, uh, to travel down. So. Yeah. But, no, so, so how did Ford kind of... Um, react i mean i don't want to make it forward like this big company but who are you were working with as far as the selection process i mean were they kind of taken aback were they you know how, how, how do they you know kind of kind of feel about you saying no let's let's give it to somebody else since i won't be here to to properly receive it i mean they, they were cool about it they were pretty accommodating i mean obviously and it was part partially my misunderstanding at the beginning as well but um basically we went through that uh that process. And I was like, Oh, I didn't like realize that I would have missed one of these dates, you know? So then I was like, okay, well that was, that was going to be one of the bigger events in the program. So from there ended up, uh, turning it down. And, you know, I, I feel better doing that than, uh, even if they did make the accommodation to like, let me miss two. Cause you know, there, I'm sure there's someone else that was equally qualified and highly qualified and ready to fill in that spot. So so what were they yeah. looking to, so, sorry, but so with the 30 under 30, I was kind of looking over my notes to, to get a better idea. And how, like, so what is the selection process? Cause it sounds like you're talking about different stages or almost like, yeah, so, I don't want to say, so I don't want to say pieces out, of competition, but you know, so, so what right. is the whole, the whole shebang? It, it starts out, um, there's about like uh, the whole field of applicants that are over like 200 
Um, from there, that's that's just based off like a paper submission. So you kind of write out kind of like a resume of your um, uh, volunteer opportunities and experiences. And then from there, they wean it down to uh, 60. And from there, you make a 30 second video, which uh, I appreciate you helping me out on, but you make a 30 second video basically talking about why you think you'd be a good fit, uh, how you make people's lives better or a couple other prompts. And then from there, they select the final 30 out of the 60, you make a video. Awesome. Very so, cool. Very cool. So, so it's basically like a, like a volunteer kind of think tank, I'd say. So like they try and pick like some of the um, people with a lot of experience in volunteer organizations from four and they all kind of contribute on a, on a project. And so is that, so what's Ford's long-term you know, goal or benefit? I don't want to make it sound like they're, you know, trying to you know be conniving or something like that, but I mean, you know, how does this help them, you know, with any of their initiatives as far as with potentially like community or, or things of that nature? Uh, well, I think, and I mean, obviously I'm speaking just, just uh, personally and not on behalf of Ford or anything like oh, that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But um, I mean, they, they always, especially with uh, Bill Ford at the helm, they've always been really keen on uh, community outreach and things. I mean, Bill Ford's been forever. I think there's the... Uh, I don't know if he created the Ford, Found, Ford Foundation, but I know he's been working uh, a lot with it. So, um, okay. so they, they, I mean, they've been doing a ton of volunteer work. And so the 30 under 30 is kind of, to my knowledge, Bill Ford's um, kind of his own creation to kind of channel some of the, what he views as top talent within the organization to help uh, other companies and up and coming volunteer organizations around. Cause I mean, obviously when you're starting up a volunteer or a, uh, charity or something like that you're going to be uh kind of strapped for cash at first and maybe strapped right. for uh new ideas so he i guess he wants to use his established um company and his kind of talent pool to to help out smaller uh organizations no that's very cool i mean uh, as somebody from the outside looking in uh the philanthropic side of of what you're doing and kind of the selection process is really really cool so if we dig into just a little bit like what do you think were some of the highlights that allowed you to, you know, potentially stand out. And this isn't, I don't mean to say it like, you know, what kind of grandiose things did you did, did you do, though I'm sure you did. Um, but do you think there was a way you might have presented them that helped you stand out or just kind of the, the items that you had on your list? What do you, what do you think helped you move up? Um, I think that the, the way that I did the video, I think helped a lot because you know, I kind of thought it would be uncomfortable for me to sit and like, you know, with a, with a plain backdrop, just my face rattling off the things that I think are cool about myself. You know, I think that that's a, I don't know, something similar to Kanye West morning routine, but, but basically like I wanted to get, uh, get other people's insight on, uh, I don't know, like kind of pose them a question, like let them know what it's for, but then be like, Hey, if you think I've made your life better, like film a short snippet. And I think that that was a compelling way to, uh, kind of announced that because I didn't like set it up like, Hey, I want you to read this for me. I was like, Hey, so I'm doing this. This is what it's like. The requirements are, this is the prompt. And then if you want to, if you think that I've made your life better in some way, then like if you read that out and then I can throw it in the video. And I had a pretty good response to it. A lot of people put forward and stuff. And it was, I mean, it was pretty cool just to kind of hear from people that I didn't really think that I had an impact on, you know, put a video forward and I was like, okay, well that's pretty cool. So I think that that was a big part of it, how that video went. And I probably have to uh, give kudos to my tech savvy parents and how they kind of raised me to uh, video edit and things like that. That's definitely helped me out. With the videos that came in from those that you reached out to, were there, you know, common themes that you saw people speaking to that you kind of, you didn't realize that they were, you know, like, I guess, or maybe you kind of knew they were there, but they were below the waterline to you, that you were surprised yeah. had such a big impact? For sure. Um, I think just like, kind of small things like um there's one friend of mine who said like uh that he was kind of having anxiety issues and uh he said that yeah i just like uh asked you if you want to hang out just because like i was kind of like anxious and stuff and you said yeah and then we just kind of hung out and like just normally like i don't know played video games and stuff this was back in college and i kind of thought like i don't know like like there's so many situations like that that you might think are just kind of run-of-the-mill normal situations that end up being you know an impactful thing like they're like yeah that really helped me out and i'm like you know, I didn't really think I was doing like this grand gesture. So I don't know, it kind of made me reevaluate how uh, you kind of have to be like always present and like realize that the things that you do might be impactful. So you just kind of try and be your, 
be your best self and you never know what's really going to stick or what could really like make someone's life better or their day better. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, that is kind of interesting of how the, you know, the choices you make, you really never get a good idea of where those ripples actually go. You know, I mean, they can hit the shoreline closest to you or go on for, you know, years and years and years, and you may not even see them hit the, hit the shore that they're intended for. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, absolutely. that's really pretty, pretty interesting to see that kind of effect take place. So you put the video together, uh, edited it out, had a bunch of people uh, basically talk about how you had impacted your life. And then what would have been the, the next step as far as like final selection? Was there like a uh, capstone? Is this where you were saying like the whole group gets together and works on something or? Yeah. So, so once they select the final 30, which I think was from a, I mean, they did a, they did like, I mean, they really took a lot of care on it. So I think that was, that was cool on their part to get so many people from different skill teams to uh, take a look at it. Um, so they all took a look at it and went through a pretty long selection process. And then uh, once the, once you have the final 30, um, they basically start out with like a welcome session. Um, so you get to like have lunch and meet Bill Ford and stuff. And then you get to, from there, kind of get introduced to the uh, central issue or the central uh, charity that you're going to be working with. Uh, I think last year it was something to do with uh, homelessness in uh, the Detroit region. And then I think, uh, I'm not sure what this year's is, but they, they'll present some sort of problem like that. And then uh, kind of introduce that to the team. And then the team will start working through that with a variety of sessions, I think four to six sessions throughout the course of the year. Very cool. Very, very cool. And so when it comes back around this, or I guess now this year, 2019, you're going to throw your hat back into the ring and see where it goes. Well, you know, definitely best Absolutely. of best of luck. I, uh, you know, I think you got a couple more years before you get into the over 30 league. So yeah, yeah couple, exactly. If couple, I was couple years to go at it. 29, I would have, yeah, if I was 29, I probably would have been more upset or moved my vacation around or something like that. But I'm 23, so I got a couple more shots at it. Good for you. And I got some, I got some good <laughs> friends that, uh, in the group too. So I get, I get to root on from the sidelines for sure. No, that's that's definitely awesome. I mean, a lot of those experiences, the uh, the camaraderie that you get and going through those kind of struggles is sometimes worth more. You know, the the journey's worth more than the actual end point that you get to. Absolutely, and I mean, even just getting in the top sixty and then getting selected initially, I was like, man, that's that's crazy to even think that out of like all the amazing people I know within the company to to be picked as one of them. And even if though so, I was disappointed I couldn't uh, participate this year, I mean, I look forward to giving another shot next year and hopefully uh, putting my video editing skills to the test yet again. Very cool. Very cool. And so one of the things, I, uh, the reason I wanted to reach out to you is, you know, we've been talking a lot about this 30 under 30, but, you know, there's a lot of facets to to yourself. Um, again, you know, as, a, as an outsider looking in and, and um, you know, seeing each other kind of grow up, grow up through years just because of the family connection, you know, but so you work as logistics for Ford, you had the 30 under 30 that we've been talking about. You started a uh, basically somewhat of a, a philanthropic business to support the Detroit area that I definitely would love to hear more about and how that got started. And then lo and behold, I, I pop open my Instagram and uh, now you're doing jokes up on stage. You know, <laughs> yep, I, yep, I, 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 I find it quite interesting. So like, one, how did you kind of get started into, you know, the logistics or we can move through some of those items, but then like, how do you know when to like either add something on or, or maybe more importantly, like take something off as far as what you're digging into? Um, honestly, that's, that's something I'm definitely, definitely need to work on more. Um, if you want, I could start on the, uh, on the logistics thing. Whatever um, you want, so, man. It's... <laughs> so, so for that pretty much, um, so I went to Wayne State University um their supply chain program is definitely one of the standout programs that they have there um so i, I kind of saw that group and i was like man i want to be a part of that group that seems pretty cool and i was like well i, I need to like kind of tread lightly you know you don't want to just pick your major based on like wanting to be like with this like group of people but then like i took one class and i was like you know that's kind of cool like it's an interesting uh kind of segue between you know like you have like logistics and then there's finance accounting little bit of sales like it, it's kind of like a, a good mixture of like all bits of business and as someone who's kind of a, a business junkie always has been like uh, reading about like big business and that's stuff that you and I discuss all the time at family events but right um, I thought that that was the perfect kind of intersection of all the different areas of business so I get a taste of kind of everything 
Very cool. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I think that was a, a much better way than I picked my uh, my degree. I, I knew I wanted to be engineer. Uh, I was halfway decent in, in chemistry. And when I looked over the degrees that had the potential to make the, make the most money, it was like in the top three. So I was like, yeah, I'm just going to go be a chemical engineer and let's see what happens. So, <laughs> hey, that's not a bad road and it's, it's served you well. So I think you're not a bad choice. Yeah, I like to think I'm a little luckier than good, though. I mean, I uh, I met a lot of other people that went into it that way, and they went to, to other degrees, you know, just as happy and just as successful. So I just find it kind of interesting that, uh, you know, 17, 18 year olds are supposed to have a decent idea of what they want to be when they grow up. And, you know, I look yeah, back now, I think- and I'm almost 40. And I'm like, I definitely think I got more lucky than uh, than anything in selecting my career path. Absolutely. Because I think, yeah, that's a big stress point. And that's kind of what I try to tell people who I talk to are younger. It's like, you know, if you really don't know what you want to do, then like go where the opportunity is and try not to get too much debt. So like, if you see that there's a big opportunity in this certain area, I mean, like, I'm certainly not advocating not going to school. Um, but like, you, you know, if you don't know what you want to do, go to where opportunity is. And if you go down that road a little bit and then it turns out it's not something you like, I mean, at least you didn't waste your time just treading water, you know, so you gained some good experience. So. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a big stress point growing up. Definitely was for me. Yeah, exactly. And, and back, um, you know, I mean, you're not that far away from when you were making the decision. But even for myself, looking back at it, it wasn't so much of, you know, you you, you brought up the thing of experience. Having looking back at it, it's like just do something to get a skill. Just just anything that can somehow set you apart from the the pack, um, and it's worth the time. You know, then the the issue becomes is now you have to balance like, uh, unfortunately, with a lot of schools, like how much debt are you going to take on in order to get said skill, you know, and is that, you know, proportion or ratio that you're looking at, does that even make sense? So, right. but, Absolutely. but yeah, so, so the skill set, so logistics, you got into it, multifaceted, and now you're working at Ford 30 under 30, the website. What was the what was the kind of the the setup or the uh, the origin story as far as that and then the uh, philanthropy that's going along with it? Um, so basically, I wanted to kind of take a stab at entrepreneurship in some sort of degree. So um, I created the uh, OTD Supply Co, which is basically uh, just it's just a clothing website, and I, it was kind of put on through um, the Shopify platform and through uh, drop shipping as well. So I kind of wanted to take a stab at entrepreneurship to see, you know, if I just to gain mainly experience to see if I could build kind of a brand identity and, you know, see how things work. And with the dropship model, it's not a huge initial investment. The main investment that you put in is just time, you know, so like time spent designing the shirts and hoodies and things like that and kind of trying to orchestrate a brand identity. And I think um, one of the main things I realized is that um, you have to, you have to have some sort of value up front and you can't, you have to be greater than your product in some degree, you know, I mean, there's a million places you could buy a hoodie and stuff like that, but trying to find a way to make it. So it's like a special experience. And so that's where the, um, the charity came in too, because obviously I like to donate a lot of my time to uh, helping different organizations around. So kind of figured it'd be cool if like there was a clothing company that like each line of clothing, like has a distinct kind of design or feature or pattern and also has its own kind of inspiration. And so, uh, what's in the works now is to try and find uh, artists and people that are passionate about certain things to uh, design the clothing and then, you know, the proceeds go to to them and also like the kind of organization of their choice. So kind of trying to design like some sort of brand thing and honestly just to experiment, you know, just to kind of get your feet wet in the entrepreneurship world and see how stuff goes, see what you learn along the way. And there's certainly been a lot of that. So what do you think some of the, uh, and I don't know if you've had a, a beautiful disaster, so to say, within the the, uh, the website that you sent up and, and the charity events, but, you know, what are some of the, you know, the top three, let's say, you know, lessons that you, you definitely have learned that seem to be pretty valuable from that experience so far? Um, one is definitely that you have to be unique in some way, you know, so I think like when we started, it was like, okay, it's like kind of a cool hoodie, but like. Yeah. Like there's, there's a reason why people will spend, you know, $50 on a Nike hoodie. And it's because like, they have such like this strong brand image, you know, it's like the, the materials aren't really noticeably better than Adidas or any other competitor, but 
they can get like a, a cost premium because of their brand image. So kind of trying to figure out ways to build a brand image, you know, like uh, whether through affiliate marketing, uh, similar avenues like that, but also just kind of to understand like what, what takes a brand to go from just like a place that sells clothing to like kind of an experience that someone wants to be a part of. So I think that was the main thing. And that's definitely something I'm still trying to work towards too. It's not uh, been like a pinnacle of success because I don't think that things like that happen very quickly at all. So kind of trying to see along the way of things you can pick up from other people and also trying to uh, get out ahead of the, of the head of the pack in some way. And so I think that that's been a unique thing to think about for sure. Yeah, more of the, uh, you know, first mover, how do you set yourself apart from everybody and then basically try to minimize it's almost like a, a fail quickly kind of scenario it's something that i bring up with a few of the uh the guys that i work with when we're doing you know projects or trying to rearrange projects and things like that it's like can we do something really small to give us an idea if it works and if it fails well we don't sink the ship you know and we can course correct in time to like move it forward so how do we you know, increase the speed of that uh, innovation, even if it's just simply, um, you know, one of the things we were working on recently was just, you know, real quickly, like, okay, well, how do we close out our projects faster? Like, what does that look like? Like, how do we close them, make sure the customer is involved so they understand what's going on? You know, how do we speed that whole process up? And, uh, and it's just been kind of an interesting, like, we'll try, you know, different little things with uh, ourselves or our contractors and, and just trying to test that out. So sounds like you're kind of in that same scenario of, you know, make small changes, test real quickly, you know, survival of the fittest and then move on. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it, it could be a total flop, you know what I mean? It could be, it could like be something that lasts maybe another year or another hundred years, you know. But even if it is a total flop, like what I liked about uh, this opportunity specifically is like with the dropship model and stuff like that, it's not like I'm buying a warehouse and then all these like t-shirt presses. Like if I fail, I mean, I lose. I wouldn't really be at any loss at all. I mean, maybe a loss for time, but you, you, the way I see it, I know the way you see it too, is that a failure is just a result that you didn't expect, you know? So you, you get a failure and you're going to learn way more than that than you would just like thinking and writing in your journal. You know, I think like when you, especially in business, and you get out there and start trying to move around and do things, see how the market reacts to stuff and see how people react to certain offerings and certain advertisements and things like that. I mean, you can, you can start, especially in the internet age, you can start a pretty unique company and just kind of take a stab at it, see how it goes. And if it fails, you're not out of your uh, life's earnings and you get to, you know, move on and try something else. Right, 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 right. Yeah, you never want to have that fatal mistake. You always want to come back and fight another day. That's absolutely true. Yeah, absolutely. So with the the drop shipping and stuff like, so up until now, have you? I mean, it sounds like I mean, with the number of people that you interact with, I mean, do you have people that you've looked at or maybe called out specifically as you know mentors or or coaches? And and I mean, you don't have to name names or anything like that, but you know, if you have had them, do you? Have you found some qualities within those mentors that have really stood out that you've been like, uh, like really like, you know, you gravitated towards because of the way, you know, they interacted or the information that they had? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's some that are like uh, people close to me, like my dad is one for sure. He has a successful business that he started from the ground up, which uh, is a big inspiration for sure. And, uh, and, you know, like kind of the traditional mogul gurus you know like tony robbins i think i found my dad's old personal power tony robbins tapes when i was uh helping sweep his office like way back in i think high school okay but i popped one in i popped one in my car and was listening to it and i was like yeah this is pretty cool i think that was kind of the start of my own personal growth was um those personal power tapes so uh if, if tony robbins ever happens to listen to this podcast thank you man but uh <laughs> but that one is that one like it's really cool to see like how he was saying you could control your own emotions and you control your own destiny through kind of controlling your emotions. And at first you're kind of like, yeah, you know, it sounds like this typical, uh, you know, self-motivation stuff, but then you kind of try and you apply it in your own life and you realize like that most of the things that hold you back are your own, you know, your own issues or your own thoughts. So once you kind of eliminate those, like the, the world's kind of your oyster, it's kind of cool. Mm hmm yeah, agreed. You got to figure out when you're actually getting in the way of yourself as opposed to to other obstacles. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. And that's um, I haven't listened to those tapes, so I have noodled around on some of the stuff from Tony. And one of these days, I'll just take a deep dive on it. But 
Um, it is interesting, the other people that I've listened to where a similar scenario of came across the tapes, et cetera, et cetera. And then after a little while, they kind of went, oh, there is something to this. This is kind of interesting. So very yeah, cool. I'm reading, I'm reading the, uh, I think it's, I forget what it's called. I think it's Unleash the Giant Within or something like that. Yep. If you see something similar to that title, yeah, that's a great book. Been been a big fan of that one. Still working my way through it. Gotcha. Very cool. Yeah, that is a, yeah, it's definitely on my uh, to read list along with about 50 other books I got to get through soon. Yeah, they, they keep getting longer. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Exactly. The list never gets shorter, which I guess is good. It just proves the fact that there's a ridiculous amount of information out there. But um, I think one of the things that I found with that is that like you were talking about earlier is sometimes you just got to stop reading and you just got to start doing. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want, we can switch gears. So the stand up stuff. Um, I mean, I've known you as a funny guy. You and I are always, you know, cracking jokes back and forth when we meet up and, and so on and so forth. But stand up. I mean, it's it's definitely a different medium than, you know, cracking jokes around the, the dinner table. How did you uh, get started into that? Um, basically, I kind of uh, try to make, I guess you could say like a New Year's resolution, try to take like a, a look at things that I want to start doing more and get out of my comfort zone was definitely one. And uh, I mean, throughout school, I've been uh, like doing some speaking, you know, like you have business presentations, and things like that. But kind of wanted to really take a big step out of my comfort zone and something that I think I could be good at if I really tried at it. So I was thinking, well, you know, I, I'm usually good at making people laugh. That's something that I like to do. So I kind of just forced myself to go up and, you know, my first time wasn't great, but uh, like I took the uh, advice of some older comedians and said like, try and drive like an hour or so to your first uh, stand up ever, because then if you bomb, you drive an hour back and you don't know anybody there. So I think that was a good, that was some good advice. And I think it's been going pretty well from there. So we have a show at the Broadway comedy club in New York city this weekend, which I'm like, very excited about. So hoping that gets well, get some professional film done and then hopefully uh, keep on finding other opportunities. And, you know, the worst case scenario, which is kind of a, a nice, a nice thing for, like side hustles or side hobbies like this is like, you know, if you fail at stand up comedy, like you still, you still pay the bills. You get to just experiment with stuff. You know what I mean? And if you keep doing something enough for however many years and you just keep being determined at it, even if you have setbacks, I think it eventually will work out for you. So that's been my trying to live through that. And definitely has been some nerves involved for sure. And I'm definitely not a pro at it yet, but that's the ultimate goal for sure. So the joke writing process what is that i mean definitely don't tell us how the you know what your secret sauce is if uh if it's there but you know what is what does that look like you know how do you actually go through and kind of construct and figure out what you know bits you're going to keep and what bits you're going to keep you know working on um well the thing the thing about that for sure is just going up so trying to write stuff down i mean the way i write stuff is because most of my humor comes about situationally, which I think you would uh, agree with, with like us at family events or something, you know, yeah, that's, that's, fair. About, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. So what I, what I try to do is from like a storytelling perspective is start your joke by like setting a scene. So if you're writing, then you set a scene, you're like, okay, I'm at home. And like the mailman walks up and then you think like, okay, what's something ridiculous that could happen once the mailman walks up, you know, something that's funny. And then, you know, you take it from there and it gets, you know, more ridiculous and crazy and, some stuff starts pretty real and then you get a dose of like crazy, uh, like, I mean, obviously false things. Like, I mean, if a big influence is like Kevin Hart, like Kevin Hart's stand up, like you, you know that the story's not true, but the way that he paints it is like so like intricately detailed that it's like you, you can imagine it. And I know he sold out, um, I think the Philadelphia Eagles stadium, he actually had this whole backdrop that was like a video screen. And so he's saying, and I was outside of my house, and it shows him outside this house and then it says and the lights were off and then the lights go off on like this like the street behind him and like so he's like like the pinnacle of imagery so i think situations like that is where i think i shine the most in writing stand-up is you paint the situation and then you kind of advance it along like taking taking care of each step and being sure to describe that so other people can visualize it too that's definitely what works out so if you were talking to somebody brand new they see you on stage at the Broadway and, you know, meet you afterwards and they go, Hey, how do I get to, you know, 50%, 80% of where you are as quickly as possible? You know, what are some of the things that you would tell that person? Uh, I think just do it as much as you can. I mean, if you want to be like a basketball player, like you 
just get that gym time in. You know what I mean? Like go to open mics as much as possible. Like write a bunch of stuff, go to like 10 open mics in a night if you can and try different material at each one, you know, see what sticks and then keep building that. So you have a good five minutes and then eventually maybe you'll have a good 15 minutes and then eventually you'll have an hour and then Netflix calls. Hopefully that's, that's, that's the goal at least. But like, I <laughs> definitely, definitely just try, you know, just, just give it a shot and don't be, like if you go and someone heckles you or you go or you kind of bomb, I mean, just don't take it as like, that means I'm not funny. Take it as like, okay, I wasn't on that time. Like what can I change? What can I change up? You know? So I think just, I feel like people, and I know myself too, get kind of caught up in failures and you think about it and you think it's like a personal flaw, but you know, sometimes maybe the night's just not right for you. So get back up and try and make some adjustments and see if it works out better. So I think just experience. So how many times have you actually gotten up on stage? You got a general idea? Honestly, not many at all. So my, I kind of got lucky with the, um, with the, uh, with the Broadway ones and these other shows I've been grabbing. It's honestly, I've only gone up to do stand up. I think like three times, but okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, but I'm trying to work at it like crazy. So, I mean, I'm doing another one this Wednesday in Detroit, trying to just get as much stage time as possible. And I did some improv with uh, our cousin, Chris also, but. Oh, right on. Yeah. I, I got pretty lucky with landing this New York one. And, you know, sometimes things don't happen that fast. Sometimes they do, but you know, right. either way, even if I didn't like, I'll, I'll still be driving around wherever I can to try and get more stage time to try and get better. So. Well, yeah, yeah. I did get lucky for sure. No, that's awesome. I mean, it's, 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 uh, you know, it's good to have those opportunities come up and, you know, I mean, it happens. Sometimes it happens fast. Sometimes it happens slow. But I think the point is, is that you got to show up ready to play. Right. Absolutely. So. Logistics, 30 under 30, doing charity work with your own website, stand up now. What's next? You know, what, what, what when am I going to see you on some magazines and stuff like that? Not to, you know, pump <laughs> you up too much, but, you know, okay, so you definitely got a lot of things going on right now. What, what, what do you see as being next for you? Um, I want to get into um, doing some sort of motivational speaking. Like, uh, I've, I've gone back to, so I guess to give some backstory, when I was in high school, I was an opioid addict. So I was a drug addict, a high schooler, actually got kicked out of my original high school, sent to, uh, not, not, a, I guess like a remedial high school. Like I kind of, like they gave me a break and didn't expel me, but moved me to a different school. So I went there, uh, eventually got my uh, stuff together, got back to my other high school, graduated and then so on and so forth, went to college and, and that where I'm at now, but went back to that, um, I guess the alternative high school, as you'd call it, and uh, talk to some kids. And I just really got a lot of uh, fulfillment out of that. So I think that's something I'd want to pursue more. And I think that the comedy kind of parlays with that too, you know, because you know how to keep an audience interested, you know how to relate to an audience. And I think from there, you know, you can mix in humor with like serious stuff too. Because I know that when I was in high school, at least I didn't get too much out of the uh, people that came in and gave like a lecture on like the scientific parts of drugs and things like that but like if you could have someone that really interacts with students or young people kind of at their level and then from there you know kind of establish some credibility to where they're like okay this guy's a lot like me and he's telling me something you know if, and if he seems just like one of my peers but he just happens to be you know, older than me then you know he might have something that's worth listening to so have you done anything to get the ball rolling from that respect um, so yeah, I went back to my alternative high school, spent the day there, uh, took a vacation day on work and just sat in uh, one of my old English teachers class and I talked to each class individually. And I think that went really well. I think, um, you know, a lot of the kids came up and said that they got a lot out of it. So that was a really cool experience. And so from there, I kind of want to, you know, take a step back and then maybe see if there's some other schools I could get in at and just do it for free, you know, see, kind of build my skills and do it well. And then, you know, eventually, I mean, the ultimate goal, I mean, eventually would be to like do multiple schools in a day or to talk through a podcast or something else like that to hopefully get the message out to uh, as many people as possible and in a way that it actually reaches them well. No, that's awesome. Yeah. And, and um, when I was uh, in Denver, so doing project work for a cement company, uh, something really similar, local high school was looking for you know engineers or anybody in the technical field that would want to come in and and talk to people and and i did it once and and after that i mean it was uh 
it was super fulfilling. I mean, just to, you know, have people ask you a question when I was looking out there, I was like, oh man, these kids, like they, they just want knowledge. They just want it from somebody other than the teacher up front just to get some validation. Like, oh, okay, so these are options and this is how you would do that. And, you know, I found it really, really, really fulfilling. And it sounds like you're getting a lot of the same um, fulfillment out of it, just from the interaction, knowing that you're passing off a little bit of knowledge from uh, your own experiences. Yeah, absolutely. That's been super fulfilling. And, you know, I think that's just kind of as people in, in society, that's how you move society forward. You know, like you get to be my age or your age and figure out what we did right and what we did wrong along the way. And then you tell the people that are a little further back in years and say like, hey, maybe do a little more of this and a little less of this. So I think if we can keep that ball rolling forever, I mean, that's what humanity's done for all time. So if I can take a, take a role in that, I think that'd be a cool thing. Right. Right. Yeah, I agree. And it's so, and sometimes it's, uh, sometimes that even changes a little bit, you know, things that didn't seem to work out or, you know, those painful experiences, um, you know, you still can't really even see them as being completely useful until you get, you know, farther away and you build onto it with other experiences that are completely unrelated. It's, it's funny how as, uh, you know, just cause I'm a little farther down the line than you are, but not that far in the grand scheme of things that, uh, you start to see a lot of those inner, those small instances, even though they were big at the time, they all start to weave into each other and really um, just give you a fuller background, which to share with people. It's, it's a lot of fun to, to be able to at least, you know, every once in a while, breathe, look back and go, huh, all right. So it has been a pretty good ride so far. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so easy to get caught up in the short term to, you know, think you have to make a change today, but, you know, even if you make some sort of small incremental difference, you know, those kind of wins can just stack up like crazy over even five years. So looking to do motivational speaking on top of all the other things, and of course things will fade in and out, but so how do you maintain like a level of discipline without getting the feeling of spinning plates? Because it's not uncommon for me to talk to somebody that is doing, you know, similar categories to what you're doing yourself. Um, but you get this perception of, well, they're just spinning plates. Like they don't have a lot of control over what's there. So they're just being busy as opposed to being productive. Do you have any methods or habits that you've used that, that keep you more on the productive side of things as opposed to being on the busy side? For sure. Um, I definitely like to kind of take things at my own pace and I tend to, I like to move pretty fast. Like when I work on stuff, I, I can and almost to a fault. And a lot of times I'll kind of tunnel vision in on something. And, you know, if I want to, you know, get, let's say like 10 new designs done in a day or something, then I'll go like, okay, like that, this is taking longer than usual, but my goal is still to get 10. So like, just really being like output oriented to not like, like I really try and stay on top of emails and stuff like that. So I, I don't, I mean, trying to stay on top of my time and I'm not great at it, but um, definitely time management is a big one for sure. And just setting goals, like, maybe before you wake up or before you go to bed the day before, like, okay, I want to get these things done today and uh, this is how I'm going to do it. And, you know, I kind of have a realistic outlook, but at the same time, you know, set the bar high. Cause I think oftentimes we spend a lot of time doing non-value add stuff. Like maybe I'll catch my, I mean, I catch myself scrolling through Instagram or scrolling, scrolling through Facebook, like, like which can't have value, but you know, for a lot of the times I'm like, okay, how is this really helping me achieve what my goals are for the day? So I think without setting those goals, then it's hard to to make sure you're going to reach them. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Giving yourself, you know, especially something long-term and short-term, right? Because if you have too many of one and not the other, um, you know, you get a lot of instant gratification and then you're like, well, why am I doing any of this? Or you get no gratification and, and uh, it's kind of like running the marathon without any water stations. You're like, wait, I got to keep going. How long before I can drink any water? Like that doesn't make any sense. So right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Breaking it up into smaller goals and things like that definitely um, seems to be helpful. Is there a way? So when you're looking at your day and setting up goals, like how do you, how do you go about doing that? Is it, do you go after the things that are urgent? Do you look at a calendar and try to, you know, prioritize that way, you know, and then mix in for some fun stuff just for, you know, giggles. <laughs> yeah. So I would say, um, definitely want to focus on the things that are pressing things that, um, like at work, at least things that other people are waiting on. It'll be the stuff I take care of first. And then if there's something like a long-term maybe strategy thing that I want to 
kind of build or something I want to improve, then I'll kind of follow that up in, in the free time. But yeah, definitely prioritizing stuff that is on a time constraint, stuff that needs to get done like right away, try and get stuff like that done first. And then everything else, you know, you kind of fill in and the fun stuff, I think, um, I mean, I'll, even as like a reward, like once you get the stuff that's really pressing done, then you could say, you know, I kind of want to take a dive at this. So maybe I'll do some research on this in my free time. Cause that's the stuff I like to do is, and I kind of run around like a, like a chicken with its head cut off sometimes in, in, the, in that respect. But, you know, to think like, you know, what is this like? And, you know, I was talking to my cousin today, like, you know, what would it be like to do realty? Not like I want to do realty, but like, you know, just trying to kind of think about different areas and stuff that you could try out. So I think that it's fun to fill that stuff in as long as you're fulfilling the stuff that's urgent first. Completely agreed. There's a, um, you know, Jocko Willink, somebody that I listen to a lot on podcasts and, and read his books. And um, he's a big proponent of discipline equals freedom. And, you know, kind of what you're relating to is that if you can be disciplined and get some of the things done, not really that have to be done, but things done in a way that's regimented, it's amazing how much time you have that's considered in quotes free, you know, so you can do and explore those other items or fun stuff or, or sometimes even within your job, you know, I mean, there's things that you do within a job that are just kind of like, okay, it's time to make the donuts. But if you're disciplined about getting it done, it allows you to go after the things that you truly wanted to do in your job to begin with. So yeah, discipline can definitely go a long way. So yeah, I can appreciate your, your perspective on that. Yeah, absolutely. And not and for, not procrastinating too, like in school, you know, if you have like a three page paper, you'll end up burning way more time if you wait till the end. And like you just spend all this time waiting and doing nothing, you know, if you crank it out, then you don't have to worry about it. And you could do, I don't know, free stuff. You can build on it, make it better, work on a presentation and things like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So discipline, set goals. One of the things that's interesting that, uh, that I find is logistics. So I have a good friend of mine from college and she's been doing logistics for a while. And honestly, I can't quite wrap my head around all the bits and pieces of it. And, and the only reason being is, you know, you've got like half full, full trucks and so on. And I'm, I'm killing the jargon right now. So I apologize in advance. Um, <laughs> That's all right. But within the, the like logistics as a whole, what, you know, where, where do you see that industry going? Like what kind of changes have you, you know, have you seen in it going through what they told you in books and uh, some case studies? And then now that you're out in the field, like some of those changes and, and where do you see that kind of industry going? I'm just interested because I, I honestly, I do not get a chance to meet with a lot of people that have that logistics moniker within their title. Well, I think it's a lot of jobs are going to move. I don't think you're going to, I think you might end up at a net gain of jobs, but like things like trucking, I think, um, you know, the people that uh, sit in cabs and I mean, some of the most important people in our, in our global economy is uh, people who drive trucks, but I think eventually you'll get to a point where maybe that person is like supervising an autonomous truck and they're working on other things. So they're maybe working on a laptop inside their autonomous truck, taking a, some of their, I think the phrase you're looking for is LTL and TL, which is less than truckload and truckload. So less than truckload, like two pallets or something, and then truckload's a full truck. But so maybe, you know, if you have people moving around and maybe he's scheduling routes and trying to, to make his route more efficient and maybe trying to pick up a couple more pallets if he's running an LTL truck or something, you know, trying to make these strategic things. So I think you're going to have more value add time when you start to, uh, to kind of make things more autonomous. So once you have a truck that drives itself, and the truck driver, he might still be in the truck, but, you know, he could be working on, you know, trying to get different commodities, trying to get different business. You know, maybe he's sitting there cold calling. He's not just operating the vehicle. So I think that definitely autonomous trucks is going to be a huge one because so much stuff comes on trucks. I mean, especially in auto, but in anywhere. I mean, if you just once you start looking for semis on the highway, you'll be amazed at just how many semis you see. It's pretty crazy. So where do you think that is? I mean, you know, if, if you read Wired magazine and, and, you know, some of those, I mean, it's right around the corner and then other people say we're still 20 years out. I mean, is it, is there a realistic, I mean, sorry, I think I lost you for a second, Matt. Oh, sorry. Um, the autonomous version, you think it's going to be like phased out and, or, or something like, or phased in, I guess would be a better way of putting it. Like, when do you think this is actually going to, hit most people where they're going to notice it so i think due to mainly liability reasons i think it's going to be a pretty slow climb so i think it's going to start with um 
like some closed course testing and then maybe you'll have certain cities try it out. So you'll have certain cities like, uh, I don't know, San Francisco or maybe other metropolitan areas, you're going to have like some people trying it out. And then eventually I think the big push that would ever make it fully changed over is going to have to be legislation. Cause I mean, it's like the, uh, autonomous, uh, not autonomous, the uh, automatic log boxes or log charts for truckers. So truckers used to keep their time so they have certain hours of service they're allowed to operate. And uh, just recently, they moved to uh, electronic reporting. So, I mean, that's a, that's a big change because a lot of times, uh, you know, truckers want to get more mileage and they might just ignore their, their log book or hours of service. And then, so nowadays, I mean, that's a big change and that's something that legislation caused. And I think that with so many truckers in the uh, in the economy and so many people that drive a truck for a living, that like you're not going to see a full autonomous switch over until it's uh, legislated. And I think that you almost need legislation to some degree for autonomous vehicles because if you have 300 autonomous vehicles and then you know one guy driving around crazy in a PT cruiser, things are going to go pretty haywire. <laughs> Right. Yeah. That, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a movie waiting to be made. I'm sure. Absolutely. With the autonomous trucks that are coming through pretty big change, massive change as far as the, uh, the industry is concerned. What, what do you think are some of the smaller changes that you see that are going to come through, you know, logistics um, for whatever that may mean, you know, so we've got the massive, you know, shift in a whole industry that's potentially coming through with autonomous driving trucks. What do you see some of the smaller things that are going to be coming through that could have just as large of a change, um, you know, as the autonomous driving trucks, but they're definitely going to be much smaller as they come through the system. Um, I'd say that, I mean, the, some of the major flows in a supply chain is obviously like material goods, but then there's information too. So I think uh, whether it's blockchain technology or similar technology, Definitely the way that that information is transmitted and stored is going to be a huge thing. Because, I mean, through, uh, like, grocery stores, food traceability, I know IBM is doing these um, trials with Walmart. Because uh, when you get, like, a recall, like the spinach recall, um, you had a lot of E. coli that they couldn't necessarily source where the infected spinach was or where it came from. And it turned out it was coming from, I think, just a select few farms. But it took them almost two and a half weeks, I think, to track down the source of it. Um, and blockchain is able to track that down in about two seconds. So you just scan whether it's a code and then you see every sort of transaction that that individual package of spinach has gone through to see where it originated from. So just going from store to source is going to be way faster. And it's going to be, I mean, it's a public health issue too. You know, you know exactly like, okay, this farm needs to get checked out, but we can reasonably say that spinach going to here is probably okay. Like we had the big romaine lettuce uh, outbreak recently and, you know, something like blockchain might be able to nip that in the bud and say, okay, it's just this certain farm in Texas that we really need to look at. That's where all the infected lettuce has been coming from. Whether like, instead they have to go and like call Dole and be like, Hey, do you know which packages these are? And they're like, okay, well, can you read me these SKUs? And then like, you're trying to go through all this and it takes so much, so much time and all that time, you know, people could still be eating it and, you know, stuff might still be on shelves or you're pulling the wrong things. So, I mean, and not even just for food, you know, for automotive, like you'll know like which, plants are sending you, uh, you know, flawed materials if, if way down the line uh, into when the consumer is driving the vehicle, they start to experience problems. So I think the blockchain or, or any sort of new data transmission is going to be a huge influence in the supply chain area. Yeah, blockchain is actually pretty interesting because if you think about it, like, so you, you've tracked everything to the finished product, which is a new car in your sense. And then if somebody goes out and let's say replaces the tires, you know, if those get updated as far as the blockchain for the actual vehicle itself, I mean, this puts, you know, a whole new spin on Carfax, right? Yeah, absolutely. And maybe you have like, maybe your VIN starts to store every transaction that you've ever gone through with your car. So you can see like what oil has been run in it, you know, what kind of filters you put in it. And, you know, maybe you start to get some sort of interaction between your PCM and, you know, what you can pull at a dealer when you trade it in. So they say, okay, well, I see you started out with like a synthetic oil and then you changed to like a, like a traditional oil or blah, blah, you know, all these different things. You might be able to start picking out this information once it's stored in kind of a central database and it's not, you know, just kind of he said, she said. Right, 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 right. Of course, I always, you know, when I hear about the everything being trackable, um, 
I like to an extent, but then it's the whole, is this going to turn into a big brother's watching kind of a thing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, with a ton of information, you're going to have a lot of people that are kind of trying to grip at that power. And you might see, I mean, if, if IBM becomes like the real lead in blockchain, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the government kind of breaks in on the, uh, on the, uh, I'm trying to think of the word here on like the foundation of an antitrust thing, like, uh, having someone dominating the blockchain market because I mean, running those servers is going to be an expensive thing. You know, there's not it's kind of one of those natural monopolies like electricity. Like there may not be a real point in having thousands of different blockchain servers, but I don't, maybe that's my lack of understanding of the technology. Cause I know it's a lot of uh, open source. It's a lot like Bitcoin. So you have people that run their own servers and things like that. So that's, that's something I need to deep dive, but definitely I think something that's going to be a big change in the coming years. Yeah, I would agree. And the whole, uh, this is where I found it interesting with people when they were doing it as like a, um, almost like a Forex, just a currency speculative trade. And I was looking at it going, yeah, but the reason the people are speculating this is because they could trace it. It's like the traceability is what makes it valuable. It's, it's not the fact that you call it a Bitcoin or a Doji or, you know, whatever it is. Um, right. So Absolutely. yeah, yeah. I agree. It's definitely uh, it's definitely interesting how that's going to change things. When you were talking about earlier with logistics Excel, um, we talked a lot about materials, but you also brought up data. Do you see any changes to where logistics is now? Like you may have people that focus strictly on material goods, things I can touch, and then people that are working on logistics from the standpoint of ones and zeros. And I don't mean so much like on like an IT infrastructure side, but where you know, the packaging, moving, analyzing of just ones and zeros, just the binary information out there. Do you see that being an offshoot that uh, could kind of fall into the logistics realm? Absolutely. And I think that it's like a whole different environment. You know, like it's really a, a crossover of IT and logistics. Like you have the somewhat new practice of like data warehousing. So like uh, when you, whenever you scan a barcode at Walmart or something, it goes into a warehouse and they know like when something was scanned and they're like, we don't even know what we're going to do with it. We just know we want to keep it, you know, and maybe we want to see, you know, what time of day are people buying toothbrushes? You know, like you want to see this information down the line. So you're just storing all of it. And so trying to figure out, you know, how you organize a data warehouse, it's kind of crazy to think about, but like it, there is tangible code and things like that that you have to try to figure out how to store, how to retrieve it fast enough. So I think that there's going to be a big, a big move to see how people want to organize warehouses, how people want to transmit stuff and store stuff safely. I mean, that's certainly a big thing. And we've seen a lot of companies fail at it. I know, I mean, there's been countless ones that have failed at it. I know Target had, uh, I think, a breach of their, one of their main data warehouse and data mining operations. So definitely something that's going to have a big focus, I think, moving forward. And it's definitely a new region. I don't know if they'll bin it with uh, IT or logistics, but it's really kind of a crossover of the two because you have, like an intangible good that is all this data which still has some tangible aspects as well and then you have to try and see how you can keep it safely and then retrieve it safely and in a manner that it's actually useful yeah data is one of those interesting things i mean coming out of process engineering that was one of the reasons i always enjoyed the plants i worked at that had any kind of data historian is you never knew you needed it until you knew you needed it and that was just one of the things where as much as I was trying to work in real time to optimize plant processes, sometimes you had to go back in time to take a look at the way things were operating. And sometimes you didn't know a piece of um, like an input device that was out there that was running. You know, it didn't seem all that important until an event happened. You start going through all the data that you had available on the process. And you're like, hey, what's this thing? Do you notice when it does this, this other thing happens and you start using it as a leading indicator? So, yeah, I think it's it's a very interesting, um, you know, new frontier as far as, OK, when now that we can collect all this stuff, you know, and this kind of gets into like the Internet of Things. Um, so now we have it. Cool. Now what? <laughs> right. Exactly. Because now you have all these companies with all these data warehouses and then. You know, do you, do you want to mine it or do you have, do you pay someone else to mine it for you? And then how do you protect people's information there? So yeah, there's going to be a ton that goes into that for sure. And I think the government will probably end up playing a role. And I think they already have with uh, how they investigate uh, transparency and safe data storage and transmission and things like that. So I think it'll definitely be a job though. Like a, like an internet 
logistics analyst, you know, like you have to move things around the web in a safe way, not like you're, you know, maybe trying to navigate certain traffic and natural disasters in the real world, but then you have certain areas that might be more risky or less risky online too. So that's going to be a really interesting thing, I think. Yeah, yeah, you'll be definitely be playing on a a couple different fields. You'll have that uh, the the reality and then the virtual reality that you're trying to move things around within. Yeah, it's very exciting, especially for yourself getting into the industry that's going through a lot of those changes right now on on you know all fronts, really. So yeah, of absolutely. those in there, like where do you see the most interest? Like where do you want to focus on? I mean, I mean, I'm I'm going to be presumptuous and assume you want to focus on this for for at least another decade or, or so to come. So, yeah. you know, where are you focusing your interest and why? Um, so honestly, I've been, I've been really finding myself interested in processes. So um, somewhat similar to what you do, we have kind of a position at Ford that's um, sort of the people that fly around and help suppliers with certain process issues. Um, that's something that I definitely look, looked at a lot. And that's something that I think I'd have interest in moving forward is, um, you know, just somewhere where you can kind of creatively try and, you know, break down a process and see like where the fail points are, what's going wrong, and maybe what's leading to certain issues occurring. So I think um, kind of process improvement, things like that, that's something that I've found myself drawn to um, in my current role. Gotcha. The uh, the sleuth investigator kind of Sherlock Holmes. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of fun. And, and uh, I mean, one of the things I found it enjoyable about that is um, – the the mystery you know the the solving of the problem is fun but the number of different processes that you'll see in such a short amount of time it's amazing how much you'll learn just from uh the just from the steep curve because every place you go it may look the same on paper but it's not and it, that's where i always found a lot of the fun yeah absolutely so i want to be respectful of your time and we've been talking for just about an hour now but where can people who want to look you up or contact you or reach out, like what are some of the ways that they can, they can find you, um, look into your charity, your hoodies and clothing and, and so on and so forth. Um, what are some of those? Um, so they can follow me on Instagram at Brent Steinacker. That's B R E N T S T E I N A C K E R. You can find me pretty much all over the internet just by typing in that name. Um, I mean, once you find me on Instagram or something, you know, send me a message, things like that. The, um, the website is OTD Supply Company, um, stands for Own the Dream Supply Company. So you could check that out. But yeah, I mean, if anyone has any questions for me, I, I love talking. I love to uh, learn from other people. So if you track me down, feel free to send me a message. I'd love to talk. Fantastic. Well, I definitely appreciate your, your time set aside. I know you're a busy man making people laugh and delivering all sorts of auto parts around the world. But thank you. This is definitely uh, informative, and I really appreciate you supporting me and uh, and this podcast that I'm looking to get up off the ground and running with. Absolutely, Matt. Yeah, I can't wait to hear the other episodes. Appreciate you having me on. Not a problem. Thank you. Yep, take care. I tell you what, after listening to that, I am fired up. Brent has definitely got it going on. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens to him over the many, many years to come more actually interested in seeing what kind of hands he gets his cookie jars into because he's always got something going. So again, if you want to follow Brent, all of those links are going to be in the show notes down below or above wherever this shows up on your screen. If you want to follow me, you can follow me at Matt Devitt. That's last name D-E-V as in Victor, I-T-T. Or for those of you that are pilots out there, Delta Echo Victor Indigo Tango Tango. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. That's where I do a lot of my posting. So again, if you like this, give me a five-star review, thumbs up, comment. Let me know what you're thinking. All of those help and they all mean a lot to me. So many thanks to all of you out there for listening to this. I hope you enjoy your journey. And remember, growth happens between dawn and dusk. Take care, everybody.